We are joined in a conversation for our podcast, Twice as Good. And uh, interestingly, I recently saw a social media post about Kamala Harris, Vice President Kamala Harris, that the whole theme was about Black women having to be twice as good. So I think our uh, title for this podcast is really is really timely. Um, but I'm really excited to have this conversation that will be, you know, uh, diverse and free ranging, but um, so much news happening with uh, President Joe Biden stepping down from his presidential uh, candidacy for 2024 and the you know, flood of endorsements for Vice President Kamala Harris, who would be the first woman she would be uh, she is the um she would be the first woman president she would be the first black woman she would be the first south asian woman um president so she is is uh embodying many many um interests and and communities in one one person and so um definitely want to kick it off with um and I'll start with you Mitra because you know we are the co-founders of of um, of this podcast, but also of URL Media, and we are Black and Brown. We are, uh, you know, the 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 impetus for this. And so, what is what is um, Vice President Kamala Harris's presidential bid mean to you? And what are you hearing in the South Asian community? Now, the interesting thing is when we launched URL Media, um, it was just days after this historic inauguration, and. I feel like in some ways her um, shattering the many ceilings, even from four years ago, um, I have to say, like, maybe it's just because um, the last few years have been eventful in terms of COVID and everything else. I I have not felt um, as much of that, like, history and rallying as I've seen over the last 36 hours. And so I think one... Um, just kind of immediate take of this moment is that um, there's energy again, right? Like from our communities, there's energy again. And and you could say, well, what about like Usha Vance, you know, um, J.D. Vance is the, the Donald Trump's um, vice presidential running mate's wife, who's also South Asian. There was like a flood of stories of you know, Indian Americans and their place in politics. But I have to say this, the past 48 hours, at least for my community, have felt more energized and organized. So the other thing um, is that I'm like getting a million invites for, you know, South Asian women for Kamala Harris, uh, South Asian men for Kamala Harris. Uh, just like every Indian group I'm on um, is kind of trying to rally in some way, it feels like. Um, that might wane in the next few days, but that's like the initial um, energy that I'm seeing. I'm going to punt it to, to Femi. Um, you know, you're you're the editorial director for Epicenter, um, and and I'm just curious because there was I received like four different texts uh, Sunday night for this big Zoom call to for Black women and Kamala Harris, and apparently they convened forty four thousand. Uh, black women raised about $1.5 million in the course of like two or three hours. And then yesterday there was something for black men and about 35,000 black men were on the Zoom and they raised about $1.3 million. So I'm just curious, like, I agree with Mitra, there is this like groundswell of energy and I think relief because anybody who saw the debate performance that Biden did, you know, a few weeks ago, I know I was mortified. I was petrified, mortified, horrified, all of the fights. And um, and now it's like, okay, reset, let's go. So I'm, I'm curious what, what your take on all of this is, Femi. You know, I've had a uh, sort of roller coaster of feelings. Um, it's interesting to see when you think back on a month ago, there was undeniably no excitement about this election. It was very much, I guess I'm going to vote, you know, just people just weren't excited overall. And then we we saw the debate performance. Um, we saw all of the stories that came out afterwards. And 
there's a part of me when I, I feel very complex about this whole thing, right? When we first started seeing stories about major donors asking Biden to um, step down, there was a part of me that felt very unsettled by it, not because I was enthusiastic about Biden. Um, to be honest, I still haven't figured out how I was going to vote, whether or not I was going to do this sort of protest vote or actually vote for Biden, full disclosure. Um, but there was a part of me that was unsettled with the idea of wealthy folks deciding you know, what this system will look like. Um, and I'm still very conflicted by that. But at the same time, I am a Black woman. And so there is that excitement seeing someone that looks like me, that shares a lot of my, you know, she went to an HBCU the way I did. My mother's Jamaican. She's half Jamaican. Um, so there's a lot of those commonalities that excites me. But at the same time, there is a lot of discomfort still in the way that this process um, unfolded and what happens next. Uh, I think we've already seen some of the Republican lawmakers saying that, you know, should this happen, that they are going to look at what type of court cases they can um, they can initiate to challenge this. So undeniably, mm. for all of that excitement, there's also the trepidation. Um, I also say that at times I feel like that abused dog where I don't know if I want to get excited because what's going to happen next? Because we've seen these sort of ebbs and flows. We saw how during Obama's election, there was just, I remember being in a bar when Obama was elected and the excitement that we felt. And for, you know, eight years, I think a lot of marginalized people thought that we were going to see the country go in a different direction. Um, and then the opposite happened. So, so we had this moment after 2020, after George Floyd, where it felt like America was starting to fully recognize all of the damage that had been done through racism. And then as we saw in 2023 and this year, a lot of DEI issues um, or out of, a lot of DEI support was just sort of pushed to the side. So as much as I want to get excited about what this means, I think I've, I've been abused too much to get excited about what this means. I just wanted to um, turn to Sarah and Femi to ask about Sunday night and some of what Femi is alluding to in terms of who made the decision uh, for Biden to step aside, the elevation of a black woman, of, of a black woman um, that's kind of like saving the moment as opposed to um, being elevated you know, on her terms or, um, you know, sort of this like savior that yeah, I think usually we think about white savior complex, but I was just wondering if either of you had thoughts or feelings on that. Um, and then just like what you were hearing from people on Sunday or how you spent that moment. Remember a couple of weeks ago, maybe it was longer, a few months ago. <laughs> um, I'm laughing because it was so hysterical, um, on social media, but remember a few weeks or months ago when, um, the VP was on the Drew Barrymore show and she said something like, can you be our mamala? Something like that. And it was basically like putting this onus on her to save the country. Mm -hmm. And we saw that back in uh, the election of Biden, where black women large and large came out and fully supported Biden um, and really helped get him elected. Um, so there's always this sort of idea that we have to save America but America's not really looking to save us. I don't remember um, her name. Uh, it escapes me right now. Sarah, you may know, but currently right now at this moment, it is trending about the black woman who uh, was shot and killed by police after calling police for help. And so there's this, you know, there's this bittersweet moment for me where yet again, black folks are expected, black women are expected to save the country, but the country isn't really expected to save us. Yeah. And I would, I would just, I would, I said to my team yesterday at, at Word that um, this is Kamala Harris's, VP Kamala Harris's best moment because the, the slings, the, you know, the, 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 um, the, the, the efforts to take her down and take her apart are going to begin very quickly. They've already and begun. They've already begun. And, and, you know, I, I think she's, built for, for this fight. You know, she is no wilting flower, but, um, even within the party, within the black community, probably within the South Asian community, even internally as proud as, and as excited as we are, 
very soon there will be many questions and many uh, concerns and things will start to surface that will call her uh, candidacy into question. And I know in the Black community, there are questions about Black men and how are they going to be able to, or are they going to be able to rally around? Yesterday's Zoom is, is, is encouraging for sure, where you know about 35,000 Black men convened and raised money for on her behalf. But um, there are a lot of complexities. People concerned about her um, role as a district attorney in San Francisco, an attorney general, and her being, you know, like uh, allied with the with the cops. And what is her what is her platform around criminal justice? Um, I think she has a lot of powerful um, uh, platforms and history and and experience to run on. And I think that she's going to be able to strike that balance. But I think it is also we I'm very clear that we live in a sexist, racist uh, country that and it shows up, it manifests in the craziest ways. Anytime 53 percent of white women are going to vote for Donald Trump in 2020 after he, you know, talked about grabbing women by the you know what, you know, it it is a very strange upside down world. And. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting ride, but, um, you know, I think that gender and race are going to be at the forefront. I was just going to say, you definitely see that already on social media. Um, well, first off, so we, we just published a piece that digs into some of the racism and misogyny that she's facing and really look into massage noir, which is that intersection of misogyny and racism that black women face. And you already see that on social media where, you know, they're pulling up photos and saying, um, as some of you may know, she used to date Montel Williams. Um, so almost painting her as this, you know, um, promiscuous person that was dating her way around. Um, but yeah, you see a lot of that already. You've seen already, you know, the DEI candidates, uh, as in folks calling her the DEI candidate. Um, so you already see that not even a full 48 hours into this. Um, so I can only imagine what it's going to look like in the next three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. Um, I wanted to bring Shoeb into the conversation. So we have um, the benefit of Shoeb able to weigh in on how the announcement of Kamala Harris as our presidential candidate is landing um, in her mother's native country of India. Um, he can also talk about Indian elections. And I believe he's sitting somewhere in Europe right now where also there have been a wave of um, elections. We have an unprecedented year um, in terms of the number of global elections. It's not just the U.S. So, um, Shop, do you want to introduce yourself and um, give us a little bit of your background? And, you know, my obvious question is going to be how the news landed that Biden is stepping down and uh, a woman named Kamala Harris is stepping in. I uh, work for an Indian news website called Scroll. I'm, I'm the full politics editor. And a um, couple of great questions. Um, uh, one is obviously there is always excitement in India when an in Indian origin person, or in this case, half Indian origin person, does uh, does well uh, anywhere else. So I guess uh, uh, we're a bit, um, I guess we, we're proud of when, when people from our family do well. So this is, I guess, an extension of a very Indian way of looking at things that, you know, one of our boys and girls is going out there and, uh, you know, doing well. So I guess it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice way to look at things. It's a, it's a nice way to develop an affinity with someone who is actually very far from us in reality. I don't think Kamala Harris has, apart from ethnic origins, I don't think has much to do with India as such. Uh, so, but it's still, I think it's nice. It's a, it's a way for us to, plug into politics in a very different country. So it, it's kind of it's kind of nice. Uh, you know, even apart from the India angle, I think that the news came as a bit of a surprise to us. It, it was a bit of a roller coaster ride. And I think it has a larger sort of, it does have a larger global, in a way, sort of a lesson or a pattern for us is that clearly there is a recognition almost across countries that you need to pull out all stops when you're taking on the right or the far right. Hmm. Uh, and I think this is clearly the thinking in the party. Uh, I think Biden, uh, whilst of course we should credit him for stepping down, but I think conditions were made such that he almost had to step down. And I think, I think there was a realization 
on the liberal left and you know whatever you want to call it the larger coalition that uh, Kamala is the better candidate to to take on Trump and that's that's eventually that's what counts you know the it's what keeping Trump out is really the real it's 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 a big battle it's a big battle for it's a big battle for America but it's also a battle in a way that affects all of us like you know because we live in such an interconnected world and we've been seeing you know like we've been seeing this realization in india we actually had a coalition in india and obviously our electoral system is quite different we have a large number of parties unlike the us uh we we have a very large number of parties but a large number of you know what would be called left liberal parties uh kind of came together to take on uh the right wing in india and uh, while it wasn't a complete success in our elections which were held around uh, three months back oh, sorry two yeah june the results came out the bjp which is you know mr modi who is who is our trump and trump is your modi is uh, he was actually uh, he didn't get a majority in india he, so india has a parliamentary style of election so he didn't get a majority although he still formed the government which is a bit complex to explain but but it's a weak government so he has to sort of rule he has to rule with the assent of other smaller parties so which really cramps his style uh so that's i think a very good learning which which you know independently i think and whilst looking at other people you even have this in france france is i think the most explicit example of this happening where clearly when they saw le pen rising in this incredible way there was panic and that panic actually uh you know led to a good outcome you know there's this joke that says you know now would be a good time to panic so i think <laughs> everybody saw that you know the the shit is really hitting the fan and they panicked and they actually they actually managed to string together a coalition which reduced i think le pen to third place i mean le pen is uh you know i mean i mean she might be even more right than trump for all you know i mean i don't know how to how, how do we create this things exactly but she's really quite a you know a scary figure if if you were french and again you know this and the thing that we've seen is this sort of politics travels around the world i mean i when i look at it from india you know uh, mr modi takes inspiration from mr trump it's quite explicit right it is a very explicit way of interconnecting the right and it's interesting to see that it's been late but the left you know when i say left i mean in a very broad uh, sort of non right way but when i say the left or the liberals they are realizing that this is not a time for bickering it's a time to put your best foot forward and in this in your case it's clearly uh, uh, kamala harris and you know whatever it is in our case it's this coalition which is called the india coalition in france it's it's uh, the popular front uh, that they think calling it so this sort of learning is something that i think is spreading around the world because this sort of far right thing is spreading around the world so you've got to stop it you got to pull out all stops to stop it basically yeah so i'm going to slightly disagree with something you said um, right. i don't think initially going back to what you said uh, earlier on i don't think initially that democrats were rallying behind the vice president those first waves of stories that we saw were very much pushing Gavin Newsom and it wasn't until right. really a lot of black women spoke out and said if you overlook the VP which is something so many black women can relate to if you work in corporate yeah. America you've likely had a position that you've been more than qualified for but overlooked for someone else um and so i think it wasn't until black women really spoke out and a lot of those wealthy donors realized they might really lose this base of the democratic party which you know goes right back to that earlier point of black women saving america um but yeah i don't think the wealthy donors at all wanted the vice president yeah it was also very much a pragmatic economic decision because you know one time is is not on the democrat side in terms of you know how to organize and and vet and fundraise and from what i understand vice president harris was the only one who could seamlessly step mm. in and tap the war chest the the, right. the financial war chest that the biden campaign had amassed and so i agree there were lots of conversations about bashir and newsom right. and and Josh Shapiro who's my governor and I like him very much but there was this whole range and Gretchen Whitmer there was this whole range of of people and there was the, this presumption 
the early narrative was there was a presumption that Kamala Harris could not win. Right. That was the narrative before everybody lined up behind her. But there was it was like understood that she would not be a winning candidate against Trump. And I'm happy to see that kind of uh, narrative shifting. I, I do want to just get you all's take on the New York Times editorial board's immediate call for Joe Biden to step down after the debate. I mean, they mobilized. To me, I thought it was, I thought it was oh, an, 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 an overreach and I thought it was extreme. It was a continuation of the New York Times really beating the drum on the Biden age story. Um, the two outlets that I think covered Biden's age and kind of raised flags early were the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. You know, on the outside, it looked like they had some beef because Biden wasn't giving them an interview. And, and there was a lot of that political um, kind of wondering, like, what's at play? And then I think for those of us who kind of feel like, media insiders, but not quite. When you watch the debate, you're like, oh, the New York Times was right. You know, like we have not seen this version of the president because everything else we've seen has been really controlled. And so for me, I think the editorial was this almost like a, we told you so, now you see it. Um, so I thought their coverage aged, not to make light of that word, pretty well, right? Like they put out a thought and kept hammering away at it. You know, you guys remember they did like polls. And um, so I think they've been kind of redeemed. My question with the New York Times and really at any journalism institution is who are you serving? And yeah. when I read the Times coverage on so many topics, they have consistently missed the mark with trans issues, queer issues, black issues. Like, and so when it came to this, again, it goes back to that, who are you serving? Are you serving voters who are just trying to figure out how they are going to put food on their table, how they are going to make rent? Or are you serving this, um, you know, this rich donor set or rich folks, quite frankly? And I do think that earlier, um, I do think a lot of their earlier conversations surrounding Biden's age was shaping a narrative in a way that makes me uncomfortable as a journalist. Um, it's one thing to obviously cover the story. You should absolutely cover the story. But to Mitra's point, some of it did feel personal. Um, I also question this narrative when I look at, for example, how they cover Dianne Feinstein, how they're covering some of the older um, elected officials that, you know, while they may not have um, they may not come across the exact same way as Biden. Undeniably, you see age being a factor in what they vote for and how they're voting. Um, specifically, like, are they voting for things that are going to help Gen Z versus are they voting for things that are going to help an older generation? Let's be specific around Indian elections. Did you see a lot of hate speech on the platforms? Did you feel like it was closely um, monitored or... Um... Uh, policed in some ways. I, I was just wondering wh how that played out. That's that's a really important point because mm -hmm. there is a lot of hate on Indian social media. Uh, the right uh, has really, uh, to their credit, they've really leveraged social media very, very well. Uh, in fact, in India, it's a very organized way. The BJP, which is uh, the Bharatiya Janata Party, which is the main right-wing party and the ruling party in India has really very early on, it saw the potential of social media and it sort of moved to capture it. So, um, for example, I just published an article on Hindu nationalism in the UK. And uh, I mean, I'm inundated with hate. Uh, and I've kind of, you know, in a way got used to it. But I mean, we really can't completely get used to hate at the end of the day, you know, the, we're all human. But of course, it affects me a lot less. Uh, than it did maybe a decade, which is, I guess, unfortunate in its own way. But I guess basically what I'm trying to say is that uh, journalists in India who are independent, who, can, who who write against the government, it's almost, it's part of our day because it's so loud. Uh, unfortunately, tech giants have not done much about it. Uh, part of the reason for that is just like, I, think, I don't think it's a very high priority for them because it's almost baked into their business model because it is also high engagement for them. So it's, you know, I mean, it's like 
it's like asking i don't know mcdonald's to you know whatever you know just serve you healthy food i mean it just goes against the grain of basically what they meant to do in a way right so uh, or whatever so uh, this is one problem the other problem in india obviously is the government itself has put a lot of pressure on social media giants so it's a bit like a china model where the government threatens them saying that they will not have enough space to act or do or make money or do business you know we kind of we need to just learn every minute as to how we will interact and deal with this new medium as journalists as people who are worried about democracy in our country yeah and i think that the other piece that we need to be focusing on in terms of social media is misinformation and disinformation because we know that that is a space that is ripe for proliferating um misinformation and disinformation and that's going to definitely be um on steroids with this with this election um so like let's let's just do a quick round robin um what are what are we going to see the next 100 days maybe i'll start with um with you femi what do you see what do you, over the next 100 days if you could predict i am not going to predict i'm going to say what i hope to see um as someone who you know i am a black queer woman so undeniably a lot of you know my life my family's life um has a lot of stake in this election uh but at the same time i can't unsee some of the things that we've seen in palestine for example so what i hope to see is um i hope to see someone that continues the excitement i have in this moment continues it all the way into november that's what i hope to see um what i'd really love to see is less sexism and misogyny but that's not going to happen so alas i'm going to take a us stack from the outside i think we're going to be watching your election very closely because uh, a lot of uh, i mean the us has obviously it's a very uh, banal thing to say but it has a huge media footprint even around the world so for better or for worse uh, the this presidential election is going to be closely and minutely watched and uh, you know like i said you know the indian right really look really connects with the american right so if if things get ugly for example uh, uh, you know the trump's vice president nominee has already said a couple of islamophobic things now when he says those things it provides wings to this idea even in india because it's 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 this normalization you know people will there'll be islamophobes in india who'll say it's fine do it cuz i mean look at them right they they're doing it too right so this sort of thing just gets uh just gets this uh this this sort of it gets this snowballing effect when when there's like anti immigrant rhetoric in in in, in the us again you know there'll be people in india who'll say you know i mean that's it's fine i mean that you know they're super power they, they can do it why mm. can we do it so it's it's important to see uh what happens there and hopefully you guys will make the right choice mitra well oh, say I, you um you know i'm really concerned about the media that we're not seeing on the right like i just feel like we're still covering this pretty institutionally i think url in some ways is an exception because we do have our ear to the ground on our communities the intersection of our communities with um trump voters is not um is not manifold and so i am concerned about um these like deep entrenched networks um and whether mainstream media has figured out how to cover them and i don't mean that in any like giving platform way i really mean do we know what's coming and what's going on And then the second piece is I hope uh Kamala Harris, you know, you you started us out with the twice as good framework um that she's really embodied. Um I feel like the woman we've seen over the last 36 hours has felt less rehearsed to me. I've I've been covering her for a while. I was um the managing editor of the LA Times when she was um California's attorney general and um you know, there's something about her that's um can feel rehearsed right she's a prosecutor like she knows how to you know kind of make an argument but that came off to me as somewhat rehearsed and academic what we've seen over the last 24 36 hours has actually kind of let loose and let donald trump just have it i hope that continues because i think people 
um, I think that resonates with people way more than the version of her we've seen even over the last four years where she was kind of trying to do everything right. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that's more of what we see. Um, Sarah, we're going to turn it over to you for your prediction of the next hundred days. But you know, since you're sitting in Pennsylvania, I have a big question and you know what that is. So you take it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, obviously, I think all eyes are going to be on Pennsylvania, specifically Philadelphia, specifically, you know, Philadelphia's black community, which is the community that that we serve at WURD, the, the talk radio station I run here in Philly. Um, I think she's going to they're going to identify a white male to be her VP pick. I don't think that's like that, you know, um, <laughs> earth shattering to, to come up with that prediction. But I think that it's going to be a very, very volatile 100 days. I think there is going to be a lot of sexism and, and racism on full display. But I think that the the difference between a Harris administration and a Trump administration are going to be on full view. And hopefully this country will be able to overcome its instincts of being racist and sexist and vote its interest because it's a very clear um, distinction in terms of what's in the best interest of this country, the majority of this country. So that's, that's my take. <laughs> 